The year was 1946, and the future was looking bright for the United States. World War II had ended just a few months earlier, and the aviation industry was at the dawn of a new era. Planes were faster and more powerful than ever before, and commercial flights were rapidly growing in popularity. But perhaps an overlooked accomplishment of this era was the rise of the air freight industry. Aircraft operators had managed small shipments of cargo and mail for years, but dedicated freight airlines were becoming a viable large-scale business for the first time. One of the first companies to throw their hat in the ring was a well-known but unlikely player, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. As you can imagine, this made for a rather unique business proposition. Santa Fe was an American institution, having grown into one of the largest and most recognizable transportation brands of the 20th century. The core of their business was the railroad itself, but they had also branched out into the trucking business, bus lines, and even a fleet of tugboats in the San Francisco Bay. So perhaps it wasn't too surprising when on May 3rd, 1946, they announced the creation of a new cargo airline called Santa Fe Skyway. This would operate in the same general territory as the company's existing network, connecting California and the Southwest with Texas and the Midwest. With this move, Santa Fe would create a shipping company like no other. They would offer the whole gamut of long-distance bulk shipments by rail, door-to-door -door shipping to smaller markets by truck, and the express transport of goods by air. No other company offered this kind of coordinated service under one roof and Santa Fe Skyway would be the final piece of the puzzle to make it all possible. The parent company was headquartered in Chicago, and led by President Fred G. Gurley. Skyway's executives would be based in the same building, including the airline's president, Homer R. Lake, and vice president and general manager, George W. Lupton Jr., the rest of Skyway's office staff were based out of Wichita, Kansas, and the base of operations was at Los Angeles Municipal Airport. Nearly all of the airline's pilots and other employees would be U.S. Air Force veterans, and the planes would all be surplus stock from the war. Despite having some of the most popular passenger trains in the nation, Santa Fe showed no interest in carrying passengers by air. The demand was already well covered by other major airlines so competing in that space would be a much riskier endeavor. Santa Fe also knew from their rail operations that passenger service was not nearly the moneymaker that freight was. And with the modern air freight industry in its infancy, this was the perfect time to get in on the ground floor. The Daily Calumet commented on this, saying, Air freight, in its infancy as a commercial carrier only a year ago, has grown like an adolescent boy in the last six months. It has grown so fast and with so little control that no one knows just how big it may have become. One thing is sure, it is big, and it is going to be bigger. The immense opportunity made it a no-brainer for Santa Fe to get into the business. Skyway would be launched as a contract carrier airline, meaning they could only handle smaller, on-demand shipments for specific customers. While this had its limitations, it also meant they could start operating the business right away, with practically no regulations. The Daily Calumet went on to explain this, saying, A licensed pilot has been able to go into the business by obtaining a surplus plane for a few thousand dollars, and to fly anything, anywhere, anytime, free of any control. With this low barrier to entry, over 2,300 aircraft operators across the U.S. were trying their hand at this business model. But Skyway's ultimate goal was to become a common carrier airline. This would allow them to do business on a much larger scale with any customers they wanted. But this required a lengthy approval process with the Civil Aeronautics Board, or CAB. Starting out as a contract carrier would be an easy way to get the business up and running in the meantime. On July 31st, 1946, Santa Fe Skyway made its maiden flight. This was carried out by one of their first two DC-3s purchased from Douglas Aircraft. These were surplus warplanes that had recently been converted for civilian use. The maiden flight carried 1,600 pounds of strawberries and 400 pounds of frozen swordfish, bound for the Fred Harvey restaurant chain. 
The so-called Harvey houses had been a staple of Santa Fe's passenger experience for decades. Given their shared history, it only feels appropriate that they were the airline's first customer. The delivery was made possible by a pioneering refrigeration system in the plane's cargo hold. This allowed for the express delivery of perishable items like fresh produce and meat. The system was the first of its kind, making Santa Fe Skyway the first airline to haul refrigerated freight in commercial service. The plane departed from Los Angeles and would make a couple stops on its way to Chicago. It first flew up to Salinas, California, where it picked up another 450 pounds of melons, peaches, and berries. Then it took off again, this time heading east for a longer haul to Winslow, Arizona. After refueling, it then continued further to Amarillo, Texas. Here it refueled again and changed crews, and then it started heading northeast. After making one more refueling stop in Kansas City, Missouri, the plane flew its final leg to Chicago. It arrived on the morning of August 1st, about 15 hours after departing Los Angeles. This was the first of Skyway's transcontinental flights that would run eastbound and westbound six days a week. A third DC-3 was soon added to the fleet, and business picked up quickly. Things were going so well that just a few months later in November, they submitted their application to the CAB to become a common carrier airline. Once approved, this would open them up to any kind of air freight business. But most importantly, it would allow them to become a carrier of U.S. mail. The Santa Fe Railroad had been carrying mail since 1871, and by this time, they were one of the largest mail carriers in the country. It only made sense to expand this service to include express mail by air as well. Fred Gurley said, We have been aware of the desire to move mail by air, and our natural ambition has been to continue to handle the mail, which has historically been moving on our system. We are confident our organization can continue to satisfy the wishes of the post office department by this new method. In their application, Skyway laid out three major routes where they planned to carry mail. The largest by far would be the transcontinental route between California and the Midwest. Flights would run from San Francisco down to Los Angeles, and then head eastward to Phoenix, Albuquerque, and Amarillo. Then they would fly up to Wichita, Kansas City, and finally Chicago. The second route would also serve Kansas City and Wichita, but then it would head south to Oklahoma City, Fort Worth, Dallas, Houston, and Galveston. The third route would start in Galveston and head northwest through Texas, eventually ending in Amarillo. By this time, Skyway was already serving many of these cities as a contract airline. Operating a network of this scale required more planes, and as the business continued to pick up, Skyway ordered four DC-4s from Douglas Aircraft. These planes were larger than the DC-3s, could carry significantly more cargo, and had a much longer range. Extensive custom upgrades were made, including powerful new engines, modern radio and flight instruments, and refrigerated cargo holds. Douglas delivered the planes to Skyway between December of 1946 and March of 1947. This brought the fleet up to seven planes. Later in 1947, the aircraft were given names to honor the native tribes throughout the American Southwest. The DC-3s were named Sky Chief Zuni, Akama, and Hopi. The DC-4s were named Sky Chief Navajo, Apache, Pueblo, and Taos. The company even identified 14 more tribal names that would be used in the future, as new aircraft were acquired. With the longer-range DC-4s entering service, the airline made Oklahoma City their new central hub for refueling and crew changes. From here, planes could make non-stop flights to and from Los Angeles in about 7 hours, and to and from Chicago in about 4 hours. Around this same time, the daily transcontinental flights were extended to Newark, New Jersey making Santa Fe Skyway a fully coast-to-coast -coast airline. The smaller DC-3s were reassigned to shuttle routes between Oklahoma City and Dallas and Los Angeles and San Francisco. By the time Santa Fe Skyway reached its first anniversary on July 31, 1947, it had gained a respectable foothold in the industry. The company had grown into the sixth largest air freight operator in the United States. This placed it alongside the most successful competitors in the business, 
like United Airlines, American Airlines, and TWA. But unlike these competitors, Skyway was still limited as a contract carrier. If they were really going to play in the same field with these bigger names, they would have to get their CAB certification. When Santa Fe submitted their common carrier application in November of 1946, they had to know it was somewhat of a long shot. The CAB had a long-standing rule prohibiting surface carriers, like railroads, from operating airlines. The first rail-owned airline in the U.S. was Boston Maine Airways, which had formed in 1931. While it was successful in operating regional passenger flights for years, the CAB eventually forced the controlling railroads to divest from the company in 1943. Also in 1943, the Missouri Pacific Railroad tried launching its own subsidiary, Eagle Airlines. But the CAB later denied their request, grounding the airline before it ever took its first flight. Despite even these very recent warning signs, Santa Fe was confident it would be able to break the trend. As one of the most successful shipping companies in the U.S., they had far more experience and financial backing than most other airlines trying to enter the business. And when combined with their rail and trucking network, Santa Fe Skyway would serve far more communities than any other airline. Of course, this raised some concerns that the company was becoming a monopoly. But Fred Gurley denied this, saying, I think we can all agree that monopolistic control of air transport by surface carriers, or by any other group, is not in the public interest. I want to make it very clear that we are seeking no special favors, but only the same right as any other applicant to enter the airfield upon proof of fitness and public need. Santa Fe felt entitled to a piece of the air freight business for a couple of reasons. For one, airlines were starting to pose a threat to the railroad's business. As the Needles Desert Star reported, Traffic officials have noted a definite trend of mail and certain types of freight from rails and other surface carriers toward higher speed handling by the air. Granting of the applications will permit the railroad to protect itself and its employees against this modern trend. Secondly, the air industry was heavily subsidized by the U.S. government, while railroads were left without any financial support. Fred Gurley said, The Santa Fe, as a heavy taxpayer contributing to the support of federal, state, and local airports and other aviation facilities, expects the privilege of using the facilities that it has helped finance. In the meantime, Skyway's revenue was severely limited by its contract jobs, and it was struggling to turn a profit. The CAB was taking months to review their application, and the company's executives were getting tired of being left in the dark. In June of 1947, the CAB introduced a new policy. Contract airlines could now temporarily operate as common carriers, as long as their certification was under review. This would have been good news for Santa Fe Skyway, but the rule specifically denied this privilege to airlines owned by railroads. Santa Fe felt singled out by this rule, and they petitioned the CAB to remove it so that all applicants could be treated equally. Meanwhile, Competitors like TWA were opposed to Skyway's growth, and urged the CAB to deny their application. Despite the uphill battle, some industry experts felt there was a good chance Skyway would be certified. Many of the airline's own customers were eager for it to happen. Unfortunately, things began to unravel all at once. On November 25th, the Flying Tiger Line and California Eastern Airways filed a suit in U.S. District Court against Santa Fe Skyway. They claimed that the airline was overstepping its bounds and operating as a common carrier, despite not being certified to do so. They stated, quote, Santa Fe Skyways Inc. has been operating DC-3s and DC-4s between Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York with such regularity as to constitute a common carrier operation. Just 10 days later, and after a year of silence, the CAB finally ruled on Skyways' application the airline would not be allowed to become a common carrier. In line with their previous rulings, the board felt that a rail-owned airline was not in the public interest. Santa Fe didn't publicly respond for over a month. But on January 13, 1948, company president Homer Lake issued a long public statement announcing that the airline would end all operations. 
He said, It is obvious that the board does not share our view that the real interest of the public is in the quality and cost of service, but that the primary issue is who should be allowed to give service to the public. The action of the board in singling out Skyway is a clear indication that the board is determined to exclude surface carriers from any effective participation in the development of air transport. The company's executives weren't alone in this opinion. Others agreed that Santa Fe would have brought a unique brand of innovation to the industry. An editor for the Hollywood Citizen News said, If a rail carrier is less competent, skilled, or financed than some other applicant, those factors should be taken into consideration. But the mere fact that one applicant is a rail carrier and another is not should not determine which applicant is in the better position to render public service. Shortly after their announcement, the last flight of Santa Fe Skyway landed on January 15, 1948. 140 employees were left to find other work, and the seven aircraft were sold off over the next several months. Twenty-two years after the fall of the airline, Santa Fe made one more attempt at entering the aviation industry. In October of 1970, they launched a new subsidiary called Santa Fe Air Freight. This was a freight forwarding company that handled the planning and logistics of air shipments, without actually operating the aircraft themselves. But the business never turned a profit, and it was discontinued a few years later in 1973. Perhaps one of the most fascinating aspects of Santa Fe Skyway was the fact that it was, in many ways, a successful venture. Over the course of nearly a year and a half, the airline achieved a perfect safety record, flying over 2 million miles without a single incident. The Santa Fe Railroad may have been an outsider to the aviation industry, but they operated their airline as a poster child of efficiency and safety. In his retrospective article on the airline, writer John Barry said, Backed by a company whose net worth was far in excess of that of the entire air transport industry, Skyway had earned industry-wide respect as one of the most efficient uncertified air freight lines and for the high mechanical and flying standards they set. They were also no stranger to innovation. Not only had they been pioneers of refrigerated air freight, but they had also been testing a proprietary radio system between their aircraft and train crews. This would have linked both businesses into a shared real-time communications network. Skyway had even sent proposals to the U.S. Post Office Department for the first jet-powered airmail service. Given that this wouldn't be commonplace until the 1960s, it was clear they were incredibly forward-thinking for their time. At the end of the day, the airline was only a blip in Santa Fe's long and storied history, but it was also perhaps one of their biggest missed opportunities. It's interesting to consider how they might have transformed two industries at once, if Santa Fe Skyway had been allowed to spread its wings. Do you hear that whistle down the line? I reckon that it's engine number 49. She's the only one that'll sound that way. I'm the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. See the old smoke rising round the bend. I figure that she knows she's gonna meet her friend. Folks around these parts get the time of day. From the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. 